Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rock Visions 2003. This is our third year. Uh, the conference room is, has been expanded to a full day with sessions from an extraordinary lineup of visionaries, including Jeffrey Bean, Kelly Boca, Dr. Ian Kumish, Jeff Hoffman, and Mark Newhouse. Uh, what I hope you'll come, out, come away with today is a glimpse into the future of e-marketing, visual and information design, web standards, and user experience. Uh, also, take advantage of the knowledge that's around you, and I hope that you can recharge your creative energies and get ready for the web's next boom, which is coming in the now. Okay? Good time. Uh, adaptive path is kind of the world premiere and it's supposed to be known uh, uh, sort of user interface organization. Uh, the company's been very successful and uh, it's no longer uh, so good. Um, uh, it has clients for inclusion and affiliates and people from academia and uh, so let's get the here in Portland. Portland's one of my favorite cities in North America. I love coming here. Um, one of the clients Will didn't mention was Intel, and it gave me the opportunity to come up to Portland uh, over and over again, as it were. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I love this city. And, and for those of you who are traveling from out of town, let me give you a rec restaurant recommendation. We had a ate at a place called Higgins last night, which is absolutely fantastic. Endeared to me now because it had a two-page beer menu. Including, I don't know, something like 30 Belgian beers. It's a fabulous place, and I highly recommend it. Um, I'm glad I could be here this year. Brad had invited me last year, and my schedule it just didn't work out, and I really wanted to come, and we couldn't make it happen. So instead, one of my partners at Adaptive Path, Jesse James Garrett, how many of you were here last year and saw him? Good. Great. Yeah, he said he had a lot of fun. He came and spoke about information architecture and things like that, and he was quick to remind me as I was leaving San Francisco this week that um, the first question that came to the audience, from the audience to him was a marriage proposal. And he said, so you've got sort of a lot to uh, live up to. And I was like, well, Jesse, that's not a metric I usually chase, but I'll, just, you know, I'll see what I can do. Um, so we're going to talk today about, well, we're not going to talk too much about usability because I'm tired of talking about usability. Um, there's been a lot of talk about usability, and making websites easy to use and, and um, almost a science of usability. And I want to go a little bit farther than that. I want to talk about why the web is hard, why web design is hard, and what we can do about it, and how that's frankly going to change the way that we do design, and has been changing the way we do design. As I was sort of putting my thoughts together for this presentation, I wanted to you know, give you a little bit of history. This is the first site that I worked on. Um, how many of you recognize this interface? Oh, good. I'm glad to see some hands because I have to fewer and fewer hands every time I show this interface. I didn't think at this point in my career I, I'd be, uh, I'd be uh, the old timer looking back at when I was a kid. That's how we did websites. So it's, uh, I'm glad there's some of you out there with me. Um, but I, so I was thinking about this. I built this website 10 years ago. That's, a, that's an awful long time. And the web is so different now than we were doing than the web that we were building back then. There's a story I like to tell about that difference. I'm sure some of you have heard this before um, because I've told it a lot, but it's, it's, it really sort of captures what's, what happened back then and how things are different now. Now, Will mentioned that I'm a cyclist. I cycle every day. I love it. And if I seem a little bleary-eyed because I've been getting up at 6 a.m. to watch a Tour de France and see Lance put the yellow jersey on his shoulders again. Um, but back in 1994, I was riding my bike across town going to Wired, where I work, um, and if you know San Francisco, you know there's no flat streets at all, um, and I was coming down one of these streets doing, I don't know, 30, 35 miles an hour, really flying, when a big Lincoln Town car turned left in front of me, I hit the rear fender and flew through the air in a sort of cinematic moment, into the pavement, broke my shoulder, ambulance came, scooped me up, put me in the back of the, uh, of the ambulance, along with my bike, of course, the bike comes with me, I insisted, and so my bike and I crossed town to San Francisco General Hospital, and there was this... I guess the EMT, the guy in the back, right, that, that, that uh, was looking after me as we, as we raced across town, and he said, so are you, um, are you in a lot of pain? And I said, well, yeah. Uh, and, and he says, well, is there, um, 
is there anything I can get for you? Can I get you some oxygen or something like that? Or, or you know, do you need anything? And I was like, no, 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 I'll be fine. And he's like, well, what do you do for a living? He's trying to get my mind off of what's just happened to me. And I said, I'm a web designer. I, I make websites. And he said, well, that's very interesting because I have a website. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> And he says, yeah, I'm trying to get all my gifts to dither into the website color palette in Photoshop. Do you know how to do that? And I said, just give me the oxygen. I guess I could use it. <laughs> but that story, right, shows what the web was like in 1994. Everybody who was on the web then also made websites. If you produced a website, you could be pretty confident that your audience was fairly technologically sophisticated. They knew sort of what was going on, because it was hard to get on the web back then. Right? You had to add stuff to your computer, and, and, and it was sort of a chicken and egg problem to get things working right. So it was a technological challenge just to get on the web, which allowed us to build websites like this, which are, well, I still think this is a beautiful website, and I love the aesthetic, and I can't remember at all what any of those icons mean. I can't. Well, except coin, which was, of course, e-commerce. But it's baffling, right? And that was part of the point. We were making an experience that would have an atmosphere. You'd click through and explore and look for stuff. and, and Sure, whatever, but the web was slow back then and it was painful and every click was a big commitment. This is a disaster. You can't find anything here, right? And so while I appreciate the, the aesthetic and I appreciate how we sort of push the web past the gray backgrounds and the beveled edges and all of that kind of stuff, um, you know, wh what do you do with this? Our audience is so much different now. Ten years later, our audience, I mean, we don't, we compete with television and we compete with mass media and people don't surf the web so much as use the web to get things done. And you can't necessarily create a sustain, an economically sustainable website that allows people to explore and browse around and have an experience. We can create websites like that, but we can't make them sustainable from a business perspective. And that's where a lot of the focus of what I've been doing for the last few years has been. How can we do this? How can we bring these things together? I'm going to give you another example. Let me tell you another story. This is my kitchen. Uh, this was my kitchen actually last year. Uh, I'll show you my new kitchen at the end of this. But my kitchen, uh, my, my wife and I decided we're going to do the whole thing, tear it all the way out to the studs and, and redo the kitchen. It's not fun to live like this, but it is fun to buy new appliances. Um, so we did, uh, come on, it's new stuff, it's great. So we did a lot of shopping, and we used the web, of course, to, to educate ourselves on what should, we should be buying. And I found myself going to the Maytag website to find a new refrigerator. So I'm comparing all the different refrigerators from all the different manufacturers and trying to find something that, that I particularly liked or that met all of our needs. And at the time that we were doing this research um, was a time in California where our utility rates had just about tripled the electricity usage. I know it probably happened here in Oregon, too. Um, and somehow, somewhere, um, there's guys from Enron that are going to get slapped on the wrist for this, but it had something to do with that, and it cost a lot of money for energy, so we wanted something that was very economical in terms of its energy consumption. All of their co competitors had that information on their website, that, that Energy Star compliance, but Maytag didn't, so I sent them a note, and I said, hi, I'm remodeling my kitchen and buying new appliances, and while researching my decisions, I visited your website to see how your refrigerators compare. I explained how energy ratings are important and how I couldn't find it here. And, and of course, being a consumer of a website, part of the audience, I assume this is my fault and I'm doing something wrong, right? I am not, am I not looking in the right place? So I get an email back from Eric at Maytag Customer Service that says, thank you for visiting the homepage. We welcome the opportunity to assist you in the future. Please include, please forward your model number so we can send you the energy rating for that model. All right, so I say, Eric, I don't think you understand. Uh, I'm, I'm going to buy a new one, and I'm going to compare all of your refrigerators and see which has the best energy rating. So I get a note back from Jennifer that says, well, the, the energy ratings aren't on the website. Sorry for the inconvenience. And so now I thought, oh, I'm going to see how far this goes, right? So I say, Jennifer, right now I'm, I'm like in the one percentile of people that would even bother with Maytag at this point. I say, right. I realize that. Uh, that's why I mentioned it. It's a pretty crucial decision-making point for a lot of people, including me. You should consider having the web team add it to the standard product page. And I'm thinking, hey, Maytag is one of our clients for Adaptive Path here. Um, Scott now writes back and says, thank you for your comments regarding the Maytag homepage. In the future, please include the model number of your Maytag appliance. So, so why do I put this in, in a presentation about web design at a web conference? 
this should be part of the keynote for the, uh, the CRM, right? Customer relationship management problems that enterprises are facing today. The problem is that they had the information. They had the thing that would satisfy my goal, and they didn't put it on their website. Why not? All their competitors had it. It was clearly important to me. It is clearly important to them because now it is, a year and a half later, Maytag now has that information on their website, but they chose not to put it on there. And if it's an oversight, then they, they didn't do complete discovery with their audience and their, and their the goals of their audience. And if it's a technological legacy issue because it's on some other database, then so be it. But why wasn't it there? They didn't understand my needs as part of their audience and did not satisfy those needs when I visited their website. And that it's the kind of issue that we face every day on the web today. Making a site functional based on what our audience is expecting from it. And those are the kinds of things I want to talk about today. How do we figure out what people want? How do we match that up to the stuff that we have? And how do we create an experience that's intuitive, makes sense to people when they come, so they don't get into this sort of <laughs> customer service nightmare that I was having here. I, um, I wouldn't be a consultant without the three circles that intersect with the sweet spot in the middle, so I will, I will make you suffer through one. Um, but this is the way in which we look for success in user experience. We look for this intersection of these three sort of competing interests um, and know that our job as designers now is balancing those competing interests because design without constraint is um, not something that we often get the opportunity to do. So the first thing I want to talk about is what I mentioned already, the economic viability, sustainability of a business model on the web. And I know many of you may not be um, necessarily in a commercial space. That doesn't matter. It still costs money to make websites, and it still has to be a reason to do it and a reason to keep it sustainable. I've done work with the UN, and I've done work with PBS, and they are very interested in economic sustainability of what they're doing on the web. So that touches everybody. We need the, the people to help us figure out what is going to work on the web and what are the business drivers for what we're doing today on the web? Because people aren't going to browse our websites just for fun, like we had assumed 10 years ago. Well, we find that we have to blend that very often with technological feasibility. And can we even make this thing? I think we're a little beyond the sort of frustration with HTML and the, and the terrible browsers that have been in our past and the fact that we can route around that by, by, by trying to do things that may not be appropriate for the web but at least give us some control. Well, that's not technologically feasible. We have to find solutions that will work. That means designers not only have to understand how business works, but they have to understand how technology works. It's a very multidisciplinary field. Now, the place where I find myself is in that bottom circle, and I'm not going to put design there, and I'm not going to put usability there or information architecture there. I like to call it desirability. I want websites that people want to use, that people find intuitive, that makes them happy and helps get them get stuff done, makes their lives a little better. That's a desirable website, and that's what I want to do. So we have to blend desirability with viability and feasibility to make something that will work today on the web. We don't have the luxury that I guess we had 10 years ago where we could just experiment and build whatever we wanted, throw it up on the website without so much as a beta test to see if it would work or not. And if it didn't, we would tear it down and start over. That was a luxury because it was very expensive. It cost us not only incredible amounts of money, but it cost us lots of users as well as they would just never come back. They didn't understand what we were doing. You can look at some of the, I don't know, can you think of any companies in the last five years that may not have sort of succeeded on the web? There's a couple. Let me, um, <laughs> let me see. Uh, I don't know if you had it here in Portland, but in um, the Bay Area, we had Webvan. And you're probably familiar with Webvan if you were reading anything in, in our industry in the last few years. Webvan delivered groceries. They had a great user experience, actually. I didn't go to the grocery store for two years, and I was happier for it. Um, Webvan actually had developed economic viability. They could make it work if they could get enough customers. They had crazy warehouses outside of urban areas with robots running around picking out food for you and, and, and non-stop delivery trucks funneling into the city to bring it over. And they could make that work at the same price as going to Safeway. It was really impressive, that technological uh, feasibility and viability combining to make it possible to compete with the, with the big national chains on price, which everybody knows groceries are all about price. Surprisingly, despite a good, a fairly decent user experience and a well-designed website, they could not change the desirability of that, of people wanting to go to the store. They miscalculated. 
right? They thought it would work and it didn't. It couldn't change people's behavior. Look at another example, right? When we had a bunch of technologies come together, there were comp audio compression got really good. Every computer started shipping with a CD-ROM. Every um, everybody started getting broadband. And put those all together, and Napster just sort of popped out, right? All of a sudden, you could type any word and you'd get that song. Talk about desirability through the roof. It was a great user experience. Type a word and get that song. So they had technological, technological feasibility. It just worked. They had high desirability. Everybody wants music. Did they have any economic viability? No, well, no. In fact, they took it away from a very sort of powerful, uh, powerful industry that wasn't too happy about that and made it go away. Made Napster go away. There's always something that replaces it. But, but you can see keeping these in balance, very, very important thing to do. So in a nutshell, this is what we're sort of talking about here with our web design. We have an organization. That organization, whatever it is, has some audience, or they wouldn't be on the web in the first place. The organization has some goals. They want to sell more stuff. They want to make a profit. They want to increase brand awareness. They want to increase giving to their nonprofit website. They want to get information out to people. The people have typically fairly different goals. They want to get stuff done, right? They want to find the best price. They want to feel special not just be a number in the database. How do we do this? Well, we do that with this sort of mediated experience, pixels on the screen. We communicate those two goals together to an audience and connect them with the business or organization, right, to try to make that work. And that's what I've been spending all my time for the last two years doing, figuring out how that equation works. And at the same time, still sort of being immersed in, in the technology of the lab and web standards and all this great stuff that's happening. But this is where the emphasis has been, because this is how we make the web part of our lives. So let's look at some of this. Oh, so this is Jacob Nielsen. Um, and I feel a certain amount of gratitude towards Jacob Nielsen for bringing usability to the forefront in our industry. And I'm so glad he did that, because really, before Jacob was around, it was impossible to convince anybody to do usability. It's impossible to convince designers, impossible to convince the people who write the checks in the organization. It was hard, all right? Now, he may be a little, um, I don't know, a little bit uh, vocal about his role in bringing usability out. Um, and in fact, he says all the time, right, good design means following rules. And he's got the rules. He names them after himself. But, but that's the Beside the point, I'm glad we have a baseline, right? I'm glad we have a foundation of usability. But it's not this easy. It's not as easy as top 10 guidelines for homepage usability, right? I wish it were. I wish I could go into one of my clients and say, look, 10 steps, we're done. <laughs> look, that's all we have to do. We include a one-sentence tagline. We put a search input box on the front page. We offer easy access to recent homepage to features. That'll be great, and then we're done. But I'm afraid it depends. Every website has a particular context, a particular business goal, a particular audience for that matter. How many of you are familiar with this site? Anybody? One, three people out of this audience of web professionals. Three people familiar with this site that does over a billion dollars a year of e-commerce. I mean, they compete with Dell in terms of where they are in the ranking, but they're a privately held company, so nobody really hears about them. What's wrong with this homepage? How many of those top 10 guidelines does it meet? All I see are very excited and ethnically diverse people having a great time. And I'm being asked before I can see anything for my quick star number and password. I don't, have, I don't have one of those. So I guess I can't use this site. And that's true. I can't use this site because this site is the, the e-commerce front end for Amway. And the only way that I can get in this site is with an Amway representative sitting next to me at home. And it works perfectly with their business model. Perfectly. They sell a billion dollars a year through this website. And it breaks every single rule. All right? So there's the polar extremes, right? Follow the rules or don't follow the rules and, and see if you can be successful. But we can find something in the middle, I think. So I like to kayak, as does my wife. That's my wife in the corner there. And that's us kayaking in Marin. And the reason I show you this is because it's a perfect analogy for what I'm talking about with following rules for web design. Um, kayaking is hard, and in the Bay Area, kayaking is very easy to die while you're doing it because the Bay Area has some incredible currents and winds and tides. Something like half a billion cubic feet of water goes rushing in and out of the Golden Gate every uh, three hours or so with the tides. It's astonishing. 
you can learn kayaking through reading some books, but you're not going to get the whole story, right? Our, our friend here says, I can just follow the rules, right? And no, that's not true at all. I got this quote from a book called Sea Kayakers Deep Trouble, which is 100 case studies of people who died while kayaking. A little light reading. Yeah, I know. But, but they deconstruct every accident, everything that happened. How come this happened, and how, and how did it go wrong? And there's this quote in the introduction that's fantastic. Obeying rules without an understanding of the reasons behind them creates an approximation of competence which leaves one vulnerable to the exceptions. So I know how to read the charts, and I know how to read the tide tables, and I know about the wind and the currents and stuff. And then a boat comes by and flips us over, and we're in the water, and we've got 10 minutes to get back in our kayak before we won't be able to anymore. The book doesn't help. You have to go out and do it, and you have to understand the context you're in, right? It's exactly the same as the web design, the web conventions that we're following every day. We need to understand what we can do and why we have these conventions so that we can build stuff that innovates on top of them for our particular audience. Because we are looking at maybe the tip of the iceberg, maybe the very peak of the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what we know about web design. The web has best practices for design. They're there. There are layouts that will help your audience immediately understand what your website does. There are all sorts of design conventions for search, for navigation, for, for different browsing mechanisms, for web application. That's great, but we can't depend on those exclusively, not yet. We just got started. There's no one true way. There's no four-step process. I mean, the big consulting firms that are all gone now, the, the Sapiens and Vions and whatnot, all had their process. You stick ideas in, and a lot of cash, in one end, and websites come out, and they're going to change the world. But that doesn't work. We have to do a lot of work to figure out what to do for our websites. And that's, that's what I want to show you now, some of those things. Because the web, we're, we're, in the, we're literally in, in the stone ages of the web, right? We're just getting started. We haven't even gone through a generation of us building yet. Some of us can remember a life before the web. Some of us, yeah. Man, remember that? Here's another. Of course, I'm going to have more cycling analogies throughout, throughout this. This is uh, Gino Bartoli. Gino Bartoli has two very interesting things about him that make him unique. First, he won the Tour de France in 1939, and then he won it again in 1949. He only won it twice, and it were 10 years apart because of, the, because of World War II. They didn't run the race then. Imagine if the war hadn't been there, what he would have done. But he has the distinction of winning two Tour de France's farther apart than anybody else ever has. His second distinction is that he was the first guy in 1939 to ever win the Tour de France with a derailleur. A technological innovation that gave the bicycle more than two gears. All the other races before had only used two gears. One on one side of the wheel, one on the other side. Get to the bottom of the mountain, take the wheel off, switch it around, put it back on, loop the chain through, climb up, take it off, switch it around, put it back on, go down. That's the only two gears they had. A guy named Campagnolo developed this thing, and this thing is beautiful. This is the first derailleur. And it's got this, it's this handmade, Italian-crafted, just a gorgeous design for this thing that would allow them to have four gears, and you could change it without getting off your bike. It was a technological innovation beyond anything anyone had imagined. They could go so much faster, so much farther. It changed cycling literally overnight. Here's how it works, right? There's these two levers. The, one, the lower one, you can see you know, reaching down for it as he's climbing the hills, reaching down back by those spokes at about 30 miles an hour. Gino reaches down and flips the bottom lever without lopping his fingers off in the process to shove the chain over to the next gear. It literally just would grind the chain into it. It would derail the cha chain and it would pop onto another gear. Then, since the chain length is different with a different gear ratio, he would reach to the second one, which would detach the rear wheel and let it pop into place and quick grab it again, right, to tighten it back up. Again, at 30 miles an hour down the hill, he's doing this. Yeah. So this is my analogy, right? This is where we are with web design. We have found something that is fundamentally changing the way business is done. And we feel like we're doing a pretty good job at it, right? This has made things more efficient than they have ever been in our lifetimes, in anybody's lifetimes. And it's, and it's phenomenal. But we are lopping our fingers off and knocking our rear wheels off while we're riding along. It's crazy. It's crazy. Look where the cycling is today, right? That bike weighs as much as that derailleur does. And this guy can ride that bike all day long at 40 miles an hour over these hills. 
when is web design going to be here? I don't, I don't know if anyone in this room is going to live to see that. But think about where we are now and what we feel satisfied with compared to this. Because that really seems like an apt analogy to me. So let's talk about this design and let's talk about how we're going to make it user-centered and what that's going to do to our design. This is a definition that we've been using and adapted to for a little while. It's a, um, User-centered design is to develop an experience based on patterns inherent in your stuff that empowers users to accomplish their goals. And the, the highlighted words are the things that we're going to be talking about now. We're going we're to try to create this experience based on patterns and stuff. And I use stuff very specifically here because I don't care what it is, right? I don't care what your stuff is, and frankly, I don't care who your users are because it's going to be different for all your users and all of your stuff. It could be CDs and books on an e-commerce website. It could be cars that you're that you're uh, allowing users to compare to one another. It could be press releases on your corporate website. I don't care. We need to take them apart and look for patterns in that stuff. And those patterns, then, need to be represented through an architecture and an interface that's going to make sense to users intuitively so they can get stuff done on your website. So let me go sort of abstract and walk through that a little bit. It's how we take the stuff on our website here, represented by a bunch of abstract geometrical shapes, and find order in that, create a structured experience, and then put labeling on top of that and show people how this abstract stuff goes together so that they can accomplish things, right? That way we can get a navigation system that sits on top of that organization, right? That helps people find their way to what they're looking for and do so in a way that's pretty intuitive, that people get, right? That's going to make sense to them. So our user is happy. Our user sees how we've organized it and makes sense to that person. But, you know, not everybody's the same. One user sees shapes, another person, no, no, colors makes a little more sense. All right, so a good design now, let all of our users let get access to all of our stuff and literally in whichever way makes sense to them, right? That's a pretty tall order. It's easy when you have three shapes and three different colors and just a few users, but when you have some of the, like some of the sites that, that we've been working on are, are, are enormous and they have so many different kinds of users. It's not really as easy as just hooking people up to stuff and finding some patterns and illustrating it. Classification systems differ, and what that means is people perceive the world in different ways for a variety of different reasons, and I'll show you some of these here for a second. Some people see the world as, you know, the basic elements, earth, wind, water, fire. Other people see a much more scientific, detailed, deconstructed view of the world. Both are the both are equivalent in some way, both are appropriate, both are totally different. Let me give you another example. If you go to the uh, movie theater and you order a big tub of popcorn and you get one of these, what's that called? What do you call that? It's a Coke. That's what I called it growing up. My friends would come over and I'd say, you want a Coke? And they'd say, sure. And i said, what kind? Uh, Dr. Pepper. Okay. Where are you from? You're from Mississippi. He's from the South. Right. For some reason, we did that in Los Angeles, too. I don't know. Um, but not everybody here calls it a Coke, do they? And how many uh, pop? Okay. And how many soda? And how many do you live where it says you should live? <laughs> All right, so there's this website that you, you go to and it says, all right, what's your zip code, or where were you born? What is the zip code you were born in, and what do you call it, all right? And that's how it plays out. And look, we all, all right, so this is a sort of pedantic example, but we all have different names for the same thing, for something as basic as a, as a soft drink, right? Well, uh, so how can we expect to sort of make sure that our website is going to work for everybody? And you know what? This is just, this is just the popular ones. If you dig into this website more, they show, like, what people put for other is phosphate, you know, phosphate is what it was called originally, right? And the most popular brand of phosphate was soda pop, right? So, bubble water, lolly water, how about single fizz fries, anybody? Mixer, sweet drink, tonic, sodi. I have a friend in North Carolina that orders a Coca-Cola. All right, soda, dopes, right. So, it's crazy how many there are out there, crazy. Look at the same thing in web user interfaces, right? This is the exact same thing. This is, I want to buy some tickets, right? I want to go somewhere. And all, and all these websites have a different interpretation, a different perspective, a way of classifying that experience for me from uh, Orbitz, which I think does a really good job. Then, in fact, it's really interesting to see how well that translates to the KLM website. Even though I am Dutch, I don't speak Dutch, but that does make sense to me. I know what all those things do. They're following conventions. Southwest Airlines, on the other hand, is a disaster. It's really hard to use, and it doesn't work like anybody else's does. But look, there's, so there's all kinds of different ways to do that. 
even on Southwest, right? We have differences in Coke and, and um, pop and soda, but even one site where all I want to do is get some tickets. Well, what do I do? Do I click on reservations? Well, yeah, sure, I want a reservation. But I'm not sure when I want to go or when I can go, so I guess I'll click on schedules. Well, now what's the difference between those two things? I want to look at a schedule or do I want to buy a ticket? Well, I thought I would do both. Well, I guess I actually really want to book travel. <sighs> well, look at that. I, I can look at the published fares. So I guess between the published fares and the schedules, I should be able to make a reservation to book travel, I guess. Oh, but wait. I can click and save. Or I can go to a promotional, what is, promotional fare special. So, and they need to clearly get a little bit of consistency in the nomenclature of this website, but you can see, right, there are so many different perspectives on the same thing. Not only that, design faces global issues, right? Is it colors? Is it spelled differently? Is it in a different language? Right? That happens. You put a page on the web, on the web and regardless of your intent, it's suddenly an international page. Anybody in the world can see that page. And that's just going to confuse people if they don't understand, if you're not explaining it to them in a way that makes sense. And I understand that that's very difficult. I've worked on a website that we had to make 14 different versions of. And um, I don't want to seem like I'm intolerant of the German language, but every single word has 45 letters in it, and it's hard to fit on the tabs. Um, this is, IBM does a phenomenal, jo phenomenal job of this. For Belgium and Luxembourg, you get this website. For uh, Germany, you get this website. For Korea, Taiwan, sorry, you get this website. It's amazing. And they're all completely integrated together with the same architectures. They have localized content, meaning content specific to the people who live there, as well as translation of all the other documentation. And IBM probably has a $5 million budget a year to do that. That's great. Not many other people do, but it's a big issue. And it's an issue that makes design hard. Accessibility makes design hard. We heard a great presentation about standards and accessibility just before this, and that was really, really important. I mean, government websites have to be accessible, right? Every citizen who pays for the website through their taxes needs to be able to access the website. Well, that's happening everywhere. There's class, class action lawsuits against companies because companies do stuff like this. Macy's.com has an attractive website. In fact, it's, it's got a lot of flash-based uh, things happening here. To, it's very dynamic. It's got a pretty good classification system, too, for that kind of content. It's not a terrible website, unless you can't see the screen. Then they tell you Macy's.com requires a browser with JavaScript enabled. Please enable JavaScript or download a new web, web browser. All right? They had their front door in front of 20 steps. And you had to climb those steps to get to it. And there's a sign at the bottom that says, Macy's requires legs that work to get into our store. Would that be appropriate? No, that's against the law. We have laws against that. It's called the Americans with Disability Act. And why doesn't that apply here either? It frustrates me a little bit. But uh, it's, it's going to be a matter. If it's not a matter that's going to be resolved in the courts, it certainly will be resolved by, um, by the coming wave of new standards and how everybody's slowly starting to adopt those. And thankfully, this should be a competitive disadvantage for them eventually. Design suffers from jargon. Let me tell you, after eight years at Wired, that I know a little bit about this. I can't tell you signal versus eyewitness. I don't know what the difference between those were. I remember in the book, in, the, in Wired Magazine, they had a section called Rants and Raves, right? You would open it up and you'd say, Rants and Raves. Oh, letters the editor. That's clever. Um, we put that right on Hotwired, Rants and Raves, which required you to click to find out what was behind there, to look at it, and come back. It wasn't intuitive. It cost a click. We had seven sections of our website. That's seven clicks before you knew what was in the website, right? We can't use jargon on the web. We can't do it. We can't let our marketing department decide that they're going after a certain demographic with some hip new language because it's just going to confuse people. We have to find another way to do that. So our shapes are now web beans. Our users are confused. Why does that happen? Well, it is often driven by marketing. Here we have Southwest Airlines with click and save. Here we have United Airlines with e-fares, net saver alerts at American, and fare 48 at Cafe Pacific. They're all the same thing, right? They're all the, like, the, the stuff that goes on the, on the web. Fair 48. <laughs> Fair 48 means tickets that are available 48 hours before you leave, right? They release them and stuff. Like, whatever. I, I'm not talking about standardization for a particular kind of feature on this website. I'm just saying, careful, right? We get very, very caught up in the jargon of our industries, the jargon of our corporations and our organizations, and that comes through on the web, and it doesn't make any sense in the context of that mediated experience between the organization and our users. 
It's often driven by internal jargon. A friend of mine who works for CTV McGraw-Hill sent me this and said I could use it. He said, I was sitting in a meeting. We've been working on this product for six months. We were just about to go live with this new product, an administrative interface that allows you to set up different um, testing suites for standardized testings. And he said, you know, that second button doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you, can't, you can't create a new country. Like, maybe we can define a something. So they had to work. Yes, I'm going to click on that and create Vinlandia. That's what I'm going to do. My first question, do you want democracy or socialism? Uh, so they changed it. And he sent it to me. I was glad. Design for, suffers from politics. Anybody with this issue at all? Anybody? <laughs> Everybody's hand goes up. Excellent. The CEO is so happy because the website looks just like the corporation that the CEO built. It's organized the same way. User could care less. I don't, I don't care how companies are organized. Not at all. I want to get stuff done. That's because 20 years ago, it became very important to, de to, cent I'm sorry, to decentralize huge organizations. They were caught up in bureaucracy and process, and nothing was ever getting done, and nobody knew where anybody was. CEOs all decided that the best thing to do would be to create small entrepreneurial units in, in different departments, these business units that had profit and loss responsibility for themselves that could solve their own problems. Right? So the big corporation allowed all its departments to talk individually to their customers, which, frankly, was a good idea. But then came the web, right? And the web, suddenly we had all these business units. They're all making their own websites. They're all talking individually to their customers. But the customers are going laterally across the website. Nothing makes sense. Everything looks different. Things are called different things. Search works different here versus here. And the website is organized the same way the company is, not based on what users' tasks and goals are. That doesn't make any sense at all. All right, look at GE. This is a year ago. I took this screenshot of GE. I want to find out what the warranty information on my blender is because I lost that little card. Do I click on business, business finance, industry solutions, home solutions, personal finance? Probably home solutions, I guess. But nowhere is there any mention of their products or what they do or why there's a website here. It's just organized the way the company is organized. And that doesn't make any sense to our audience. And I know it's really difficult to tell a CEO that, but, but it's true. It's true. This makes no sense to somebody who wants to get something done there. And design has to be extensible, right? We tear our websites down over and over again because they were perfect the day they launched, but then we had to add something here and then add something else here and add something else there, and suddenly it's spilling out over, its, over the architecture that we had set up for it originally. And now, now what are we going to do, right? Like it's, stuff, it's growing like crazy. We don't know where anything is. Look what happened to, well, Amazon is a perfect example. This was a great interface when they launched. This was... Uh, using tabs, which is an excellent way to show the many different facets of one task. And they had one task here, and that was buy stuff, right? We have stuff for you to buy. All right, so they had books and music, and they started adding more and more as their business expanded. You can already see jargon creeping in. If you can't read that, at the very end it says Z Shops. Anybody know what Z Shops is? Oh, you'd have to click and go look and find out that it's a place where you can set up your own store using the e-commerce back end. Well, you know, they sort of were expanding as a, as a company, as a business model, uh, faster than screen real estate would allow, and suddenly they ran out of space. I think it was art and collectibles. You guys remember this when they did this? It was so funny. Like, what happens then when you click, like, you click on art and collectibles, does that jump down so that the secondary navigation is still connected? Or, or I don't know, it's kind of a mess. And what's going to happen in five years when Amazon just keeps going? <laughs> So, <laughs> so thankfully, they're using personalization. And if our users are anything like me, well, they've got 20 windows open at any given time, right? And they're doing all kinds of stuff. And so many people think that they're going to come through the front door of our website. They're going to click on a product page. They're going to put it in the cart. They're going to check out, and everything's going to work fine. But life happens. The phone rings, and the baby cries, and the pot boils over. And you come back, and your e-commerce experience has been sort of timed out for security reasons. And all that work you did to find those products are gone. That happens all the time. We don't even know what else they're doing. And that's confusing. So successful design has, what we've seen, is two approaches. This top-down, where we do interviews, we talk to people. And we listen to what they say, and we develop a visualization of their mental model, of what they're thinking about. 
All right? We use that to derive the main areas of a website. I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. And we connect that to this bottom-up architecture, the stuff that we have. Right? We take a look at all the content that's available or that we're about to build, develop a model of that content, and we do some librarianship. Right? We do some, in some information science to that to figure out the patterns and how they're going to hook up to the patterns that we saw in the user's mental model. And that's sort of how it goes, right? The top levels of the information architecture, the site structure, are derived from what people want from the website. The bottom stuff, the content that we have, gives us our deep architecture. So how do we help these people, our users, right? How do we figure out who they are and what they want? Because it's hard for us. Not all of us have as easy of a uh, website audience as the HANAT, United States Department of Agriculture. Do you need hay, or do you have hay? <laughs> That's easy. You're one or the other. Let's go away. That's all they want. <laughs> we have to do a little more work to figure out who our audience is and what they want. How an audience thinks about and approaches its tasks and goals is what we're after. How do they think about this? And how do they do it in the real world, separate from the web? How do you buy books now? How do you book travel now? Not on the web, but how do, you, how do you do it? How do you make coffee now? All right, this is a good example. It doesn't translate to the web, but it's a good example because you all have a mental model for getting up in the morning, finding the filters, putting the filter in, finding the beans, putting the beans in, measuring the water, turning it on, stealing that first cup while it's still dripping. All right? We know how that works. That is how you understand the task and goal of becoming caffeinated in the morning. All right? You follow those steps, and you do it every morning whether you're awake or not. That's a mental model. Right? So here's our user, and our user fills the coffee water maker with water and goes to the caffeine for be cafe for beans once a week or finds a clean mug, you know. This is what a user is thinking. And our goal now, in our particular context of who we are, is to figure out how to do that so that we can be successful with our project. So here's how we do it. We talk to people. We interview audience members, prospective audience members, about how they do stuff. How do you buy enterprise software? Right, what's the process you currently go through? Because we could probably find a way to make that easier for you after we understand how you currently do that. Right, and we take transcripts of that, literal transcripts, and then scour those transcripts for things that sound like tasks. First I do this, then I do this. Sometimes we do this. And we take those, and we literally we get active. We write them down on sticky notes, and we put them all over the conference room. And then we organize them. We look for those patterns. Well, it sounds like they do this kind of stuff first. They talked about that a lot. Then we give it a name, and we keep doing that. Then we match it up with big, long lists of content and features or functional specifications or whatever, that's ha whatever we have for that particular project. We match those things together so that we get a site diagram that starts with the things people do in their own language, right? And that leads to the top of the architecture. First do this, then do this, then do that in their language based on what they currently do on the web. And we fill it in underneath with the things that match up. That's the sort of, that's the top-down architecture matching the bottom-up architecture to lead to successful design. So we have a site map that should translate directly into an interface, directly into something that's going to be intuitive because we can trace it right back, right? That's going to make our users happy. They are going to be successful. It's going to be intuitive because if we watch that going backwards, we go from the interface to a site map that was derived from the tasks that we pulled out of the transcript that was based on what they said and what they told us. There's our walls of stickies. There's people doing web design right there, working together from what we heard users say to make things that people are going to understand. And this is what we end up visualizing at, right? These are stacks of stickies, basically. We have individual tasks, right, that are, that are the things we heard people say that we wrote on the sticky notes. And then we put those into task groups that are going to represent sort of functional areas of the website. Then the big overall arching scheme of the website is going to be collections of all the different goals people are trying to accomplish, the things across the top, this whole group of stuff. Now, I'll show you how that matches up to the bottom in a minute. But this is a visualization. We could use a little more contrast, but you can see Right? The different things that people are trying to do, researching the needs, researching the products, uh, setting requirements, things like that. This is a mental model of how people buy enterprise software that we developed for PeopleSoft. Now, from the bottom up, right, we need to understand the content that's available to go with those tasks. Now, typically, or historically, in the short history of the web, 
content has been often organized hierarchically because it's so easy, right? Well, you can choose what kind of wine you want by type, winery, or region. Those are the three top level categories. So drill down into region and you'll see Europe and America. And you'll drill down farther and you'll see, you know, Napa Valley or, uh, or Oregon or Washington or whatever. That's somebody making a decision on how the user experience, what's important to a user, and using a labeling system for that. But when we think about metadata and we think about looking at all the content we have, the first thing that I often realize is that I'm not supposed to be the one to decide. I should let my users decide what's important to them, and I should create an interface that allows them to find what they're looking for in a way that makes sense to them. And I've seen some websites start doing this now. By understanding the facets of the information that's available on a website and organizing them in a way that puts users in charge of deciding how to how to create an experience for themselves why we, we get interfaces that are just so much easier to use. Let me show you some examples of these in bottom-up architecture. Here's Sears. Sears appliance section is telling me that they have 241 built-in dishwashers in this category. Now, if I was at Yahoo or another hierarchical website, I would have to drill down. I would first have to click on brand, and then I'd have to select a brand, and then I'd have to select a tub type and a, the capacity and that kind of stuff. But here, it's sort of a big, huge search engine where each one of those facets, those attributes in the classification system is exposed to me. And I can say, I would like a Bosch dishwasher for less than $400. And it'll tell me you have zero results. But at least I can, <laughs> if you shopped for, yeah, never mind. Um, but at least you can sort of say, these are the things that are important to me, and these aren't. Show me what you have. Now, the problem with Sears is that you sort of have to go round trip. Right? You have to say, I want these things. Show me. And often you come back with zero because you've been too specific. What I really like is that Kohler, the faucet manufacturers, can you tell I did a little research in the kitchen area here? Kohler has a faucet, faucet finder, I like to call it. Uh, but they have two, three hundred different kitchen faucets alone. But these, these are the facets, the attributes of all the different kinds of faucets that they have, including ABA compliance. That makes me happy. And as you select those things, a number next to it just goes down. It's using JavaScript. It's amazing, right? You say, I want a handle style of upright uh, insulation type of three hole with a full out spray. And each time you make a selection, whichever selection you want, that number gets smaller until you get down to about 10. And you say, all right, well, show them to me. And it does. There's innovation in classification systems. How many of you could tell me the difference between Pinot Noir and Cabernet Sauvignon? Probably. 1%, 2%, yeah, right. I mean, there's, there's people who really get into wine, and that's awesome, but most of us like to have a glass and want to buy a bottle. And I like best sellers the way they, sellers with a C, which is clever, um, the way they categorize wine, fizzy, fresh, soft, luscious. You want a rich, uh, round, richly favored, sumptuous wine, or do you want a velvety, gracefully delicate, refined wine? And as you go through the website, you can sort of move the slider back and forth, and they have maybe 40 bottles total that they sell, that price categorization inside. Innovation in how we look at classifying and finding patterns inside of the, the stuff that we have. Here's another great example. The Broadmoor website, which is a hotel in Colorado, has this one-page flash-based, of all things, interface for finding out when they have rooms available. Well, how, how do you want to shop for a room? Do you want to say, I'm going to be there on the 13th and 14th, what rooms are available? Or maybe, uh, we'd love to go some weekend and stay in a suite. It doesn't matter. You can choose either way. You can come over here and you can click on suite. The rooms that it's available will light up over here. Then you just fill out this stuff and hit the button, and the button doesn't light up until everything's filled in. There's virtually no way to make an error. Or you can say, no, 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 I'm going to be here on the 14th and the 15th and the 16th, and it shows you which rooms are available. Right, what kinds of rooms and how much they cost. And you don't navigate. You don't go through that six-step process and then go back to try again and go back to and then over there I found one and end up viewing 28 page views. Right? You do it in one screen. It's great. Gary, oh, the, the camera one is fantastic as well. I think. I'm not so sure about all the cameras and if that's a, a meaningful way of doing that. But as you select maximum price, minimum resolution, does it have a flash, does it have a zoom, you sort of pick the things that are important to you and cameras go away until there's only a few left. And you say, okay, show me those. Like, that's great. That's the exact same thing I'm talking about. Cla faceted classif classification systems being exposed in an interface that's intuitive to our users. And this is my favorite here. The, um, of course, the Gary Fisher mountain bike website. Gary Fisher says, are you a woman, a man, or a kid? Do you plan to ride on dirt? 
how typically do you ride, how much you want to spend, how important is weight. And you see a whole list of bikes over here, and it just gets smaller as you click the buttons until you get down to just a couple. And once you get down to a couple, it shows you the bikes. And then you click on the button that says compare bikes. And in this case, I've only compared two, but the interface on the next page is for three. So it shows me the first bike, the second bike, and a hamster ball. <laughs> <laughs> the main frame here is the Platinum Series double butted aluminum over here, rodent nod plastic. So it's very funny. They have a wheelbarrow, they have a seesaw, all kinds of stuff. Clever. But look, it's the same thing, right? I'm choosing the things that are important to me. I'm doing that bottom up architecture, and it's, and it's important to me as the user. And that's sort of the point here, right? So, so that's how we sort of compare these two. These are the features we have on our website, the things we have available. We have slotted them under the tasks that people have talked to us about. This is where innovation comes in web design. Look, look over here. There's nothing here. These people said all this stuff was very important to the process of buying enterprise software, and we have none of it. That's the point of innovation, right? That's not innovating with some flashy web design stuff. That's not redefining how scroll bars work. That's solving problems for people so they can get stuff done in a way that's intuitive. And this is a way that we use that really makes it simple to show people that. And that's how we can, the, excuse me, that's how we convince the CEOs that we have to reorganize this website because look, they're asking for it. And we trace that right back to the transcripts. People said they do this and you don't have anything that goes there. It's a really, really powerful way to make change in a website for the better. And that change is happening in standards-based ways, and that makes me so excited. That bottom-up classification of, of content is happening through standards like the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. Go look it up if you're interested in bottom-up architecture and that kind of deep library science kind of stuff that's happening on the web, because we're adding a layer of semantics to the web now that's making things so much powerful. Even like the kids that are doing the blogs, these are great, right? And they're putting semantics into their blogs. They're creating RSS files, ways of showing you how the site has changed over time and what it's pointing to, right? A layer of semantics in the web. They're doing library science in web blogs. I read about 150 websites a day, and I do so in about 45 minutes. It's amazing what's happening there. It's amazing the tools that are sort of springing up, like a tree has fallen in the forest and the light is coming in and all these new sites are, spot, are sort of growing up in that spot now. It's amazing. So these tools that are based on this wide range of, of uh, metadata that's out there on the web and showing us trends and what people are talking about and how they're thinking and creating this sort of global conversation out of XML? Wow, that sounds, uh, that sounds like futurism, but it's amazing. Tools are supporting this stuff too. Amazing new tools that allow people to just publish, just say stuff, but doing so in a structured enough way that we can derive meaning from what's happening. More architecture, sort of innovation that's happening. It's absolutely phenomenal. And it's, and it's evolving, too. There's new standards that are coming out all the time. You should go look at the work that's happening around the Echo API and how people are, are trying to take that next step beyond all this semantic web and all this confusing stuff and make this stuff easy and usable. Oh, man, it's great. We just redid our website. We did it completely with standards, and, and we're so happy, too, that it's, it's working. It's, I think uh, the, we had a guy named Doug Bowman do it. In fact, he was mentioned in the last presentation. He did Wired News, and now he's done this website for us. We open up, we view source on this, and it's literally paragraph tags and a couple of divs, and it's so simple. It's saving us money. There's value to using standards here. No, really oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I didn't, I don't even know who that is. I swear. That's Doug Bowman, and I'll tell him you said that. So I got to wrap up now, but I do want to leave you with one final thought, and that is that this new economy thing that's happening here, this current state that we're in, I don't really care. I, I mean, I do, of course. I have a mortgage, and I have a company that we're running, and, and I have friends. I have really talented friends who are out of work, and that's a shame. But it's cyclical, and that's the important thing. It's cyclical, right? This, the dot-com nonsense of five years ago was crazy. Like stupid, like dry cleaning on the web got $10 million. It's stupid, right? It's crazy, but it's just as stupid now that people are running, screaming from the web like a building on fire. It's nuts. But it's cyclical. It's a pendulum, and it's swinging back and forth, and it's going to land in the middle. And what that will mean is that soon, normal will assume the web. It's going to be part of the fabric of life. I mean, there's just, it's not going to go away. And it's only going to get more complex, and that makes what we do even more important. 
Now, do me a favor. Let's not worry so much for a while about rules and guidelines and heuristics. Let's worry more about making websites for people. And let's make these websites beautiful. Let's make them elegant. And let's make them desirable. Because the web today, frankly, is filled with this, this sort of arrogant masturbatory design that's everywhere. That's more about the, about the talents of the artist than it is about what people want to do on the web. We, we have enough artists on the web, frankly, I think, to last us for a good number of years. We need more artisans. We need to hone our craft. And we have to get good at this so that we can make these beautiful websites. I've seen craftsmen working. They made this for me. <laughs> I want... Oh, thank you. <laughs> I want to make websites that are based on a craft, that are based on deep understanding of what people need and respond to those needs. And I hope you